having gotten leprosy and having struggled against the, the Board of Health and the, the autocratic dictatorial nature of, of fear and stigma and having patient number 3306, I mean, just short of stamping it on your arm, you know, uh, 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 changed her, changed everybody who, who was caught up in that fear. Patient number 3306 was his cousin, and Lorenzo Di Stefano wrote a play about her life. Meet this Hawaii-born photographer, filmmaker, film editor, and writer who explores the hidden lives of those who are often overlooked in society. Next on Long Story Short. One-on-one -on -one engaging conversations with some of Hawaii's most intriguing people. Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox. Aloha mai kako, I'm Leslie Wilcox. Growing up in Hawaii, he was Larry Stevens. Now he is Lorenzo Di Stefano, having gone back to the Italian origins of his family name. Today, Di Stefano lives in Ventura, California, but during the early years of Hawaii statehood, he was an island kid living in the Oahu neighborhoods of Kaneohe, Waialai, Kaimuki, and Waikiki. Lorenzo Di Stefano tells his stories through different types of media. He produced and directed a documentary film titled Hearing is Believing about Rachel Flowers, a blind musician and composer. And more recently, he wrote and directed a stage play called Shipment Day, the true story of his cousin, Olivia Robello Bretha, who developed leprosy at age 18 and was exiled to Kalau Papa Molokai. That's when he began taking scrapings from around that spot in my arm. He went deeper into the flesh than I ever thought he would. I tried really hard not to scream, and I did. I almost passed out. Jason, everything sounds good? Sounds great. Yeah, with that line with Lauren was okay, we got it? Um, yeah. My dad came from Brooklyn, and I think he came to Hawaii in the late 40s. He worked at KGU as a radio announcer. I don't know if he spun music or talked. I know when he did go to KGMB, it was a Channel 9, I think that was, a CBS affiliate. He uh, had a show uh, called Larry Stevens Matinee, and he'd, he'd play movies, he'd screen movies of, he, of his choice, I guess. They had a library of movies. And then between the breaks, he'd, he'd be sitting there with a cup of coffee, and, and he ran this thing called The Trading Post, which is, was sort of an early QVC kind really? of thing where they sold things. He'd, and he'd say, like, you know, uh, you know, this is Wong, and Kaneohe has a bunk bed she wants to sell for $5. If you're interested, call 5671. You That's know. interesting. I've heard, I've heard that since on the radio. Yeah, it was a, I don't know if he invented it or it was something that was, uh, he was assigned to. But uh, he got to be known. And, but here was this guy with, you know, smoking a cigarette and drinking coffee. And, and he said, now back to the movie. And, and then he, he played uh, Charlie Chaplin's song Limelight. And uh, he started off as a Di Stefano, changed to Stevens, so you were born a Stevens. You yeah. changed your name back. Yeah, well he was Severio Di Stefano and, and it became, you know, this was the 40s when <clears throat> we're at war with Italy and, and uh, you know, there was a lot of bias about immigrants anyway, Jews, Italians, Germans, you know, a lot of people changed their names. And he changed his name to Stevens, Lawrence Stevens. So I was born Lawrence Peter Stevens, which is exactly, I just changed it back a long time ago to Lorenzo De Stefano, which is the same. I didn't change my name, I just went back to mm -hmm. what, what it was before, you know, before he had changed it. <clears throat> and he approved of that, you know, he says, yeah, times are different now. And he, I understood why he did it. And your mother from Kalaheo, Kauai was a Silva. Yeah. And she turned out to be kind of a business dynamo. Well, she, she was uh, the eldest of three. And they were orphaned when my mom was nine when her parents died. But I think that instilled in my mom being the oldest of three. She was going to make something of herself. She wasn't going to be tagged as this orphan, this second class citizen, you know. Uh, so then she, she got the secretarial skills and, and really made something of herself and became. Uh, and I think when, when most women were maybe just homemakers and happy with that, she was that plus. Uh, she worked for Bishop Realty in the early 60s and throughout the 60s as a, one of the top brokers with 
Vi Dolman and people like this who were around at those times, really dynamic women who were sort of uh, in the business world. Looking back, I feel honored and privileged to have been brought up here. You know, um, lots of diversity, uh, growing up without fear of the other, you know, the other people that looked differently or acted differently than you, multiculturalism. I think like anyone who was around then, uh, life was slower and simpler. And the 50s was sort of maybe a fantasy period of tranquility. And, you know, and then I sort of grew up, my, some of my first jobs were, I was a busboy at Rudy's Italian restaurant on Cujillo Avenue. And I sold coal wood bowls uh, on Lure Street. And, on the sidewalk? Yeah, yeah. And then I was, worked at a candy store making candy. You know, I had two was or three that? jobs on one of those side streets. Then I went to Punahou uh, for a year until they suggested that maybe I'd do better elsewhere. What, what, what was <laughs> the reason for that? Well, I was not applying myself, you know. They were pretty strict as they are still. So you were, you were disappointed or did you I want to I wasn't as disappointed as they were, you know. I think they were disappointed. But they, you know, my folks uh, never really pushed me to, they just wanted me to be myself. And that was, I guess they were kind of ahead of the times. They weren't really autocratic about you know, because they both made things of them, made themselves, reinvented themselves from where they came from. Lorenzo Di Stefano finished his formal education at Kalani High School in East Honolulu. Deciding against a college degree, he says he felt comfortable teaching himself, as he did during his teen years when he taught himself photography, namely street photography, capturing candid chance images of strangers. I think my folks bought me a, a Time Life books on photography. It was like about eight, eight or ten books, great books, you know. I think I wasn't the only one to be mm -hmm. turned on to photography by those books. They had the great photographers in there. A different in black and white color, nude, all this stuff that was fascinating, you know. And, uh, and then I, I saved my money from busboying and all that <laughs> stuff. And, and a friend of the family went to Japan and brought back a Nikon for me. And, some lenses, and um, I just started shooting, you know. And it was a, really a sense of discovery for me. And so I got into these places. I, I actually went into Leahi Hospital and shot some uh, uh, behavioral unit for kids. You know, I remember that unit. Kids. There, there are also uh, yeah. patients with tuberculosis there mm -hmm. in your time too? Yeah. And I, again, I had full access. And now, you know, you have to fill out forms, even if you could get in. As a teenager, on your own, no, no, accompany, no parent accompanying you or other friends, mm -hmm. you just went on your own and, and got in? Yeah, I got in my car and went and, and did it. And then, you know, I, sh like I remember shooting a Young Republicans rally at Capilani Park and, uh, you know, seeing the different kinds of people who were, it was, I guess, the Nixon days and, and people with the flag. And I thought they were rather curious people, you know. Uh, I didn't. I think the important thing is, as a photographer or a writer or whatever, uh, you have your own politics or your own values. You know what you believe in. Uh, that either agrees with who's in power or doesn't agree with who's in power. Uh, but when it comes down to your work, you should be pretty much non-judgmental. You know about it because that that lessens the the uh, power. I think of what you're doing. Your job is not to judge so much as a photographer is to show, you know, whether it's a play or a novel or whatever, is to observe, uh, translate, express, but not, you know, not take sides. Lorenzo Di Stefano's curiosity with still images progressed into a hunger to learn all he could about motion pictures and film editing. He said that as a teenager, he saw the musical movie Cabaret more than a dozen times at the former Cinerama Theater in Honolulu. The 14 times I went to see Cabaret. I did that for a reason, because Cabaret uh, was a brilliant film. And I'm not such a big fan of musicals, but there were great songs in there by Kander and Ebb, you know, the, the songwriting team. But the way the film was put together it was stunning to me. You know, it was editing as uh, impressionistic. It wasn't so just shot over shoulders and you know, sort of the standard TV type of editing or even movies. 
mediocre kind of exposition. It was very creative. But I was convinced by that film I wanted to learn that craft, and I couldn't do that here, you know. Uh, there was no film school here at the time, and, and uh, so I, I uh, went to the mainland and eventually found myself in L.A. And I found ways to get into the, the game, you know. Um, I basically uh, lied about the experience I th I'd had, and I got a job as an assistant editor at National Geographic, who used to do their editing down there. And the uh, uh, first day in the cutting room, I got the job. I was like, 300 a week was like pretty good at the time. Because people now are not making 300 a week, you know. Hundreds of thousands of feet of 16 millimeter film shows up from Africa of elephants, mm -hmm. just elephants, you know. And I'm going, what am I supposed to do with this? And the other assistant, uh, who I still know, she's in New York, says, you don't know much, do you? She goes, <laughs> I said, no, not really. <laughs> so I did a couple of those National Geographic specials, you know. And I learned quickly, you know. And that, but I was always looking to get in the union. This was a non-union job. Uh, so I could work on features, you know, movies. And uh, so it took me a couple of years. You know, basically what I did was uh, I found, I had about 10 editors whose names I had collected over, the, over the, a year or two, whose movies I liked, you know. Mm -hmm. And, but I didn't know how to contact them. It's not internet days, you know, where you could just find people pretty easily. So I posed as a, uh, I called the Editors Guild, the union, and, and another group called American Cinema Editors, where these people belonged. And I basically posed as, a, as an assistant to a, a producer, a known producer. And I'd read the trades, you know, Variety and The Hollywood mm -hmm. Reporter, and find out what movies are being, are in, almost in pre preparation to go into production. And so I'd say, I'd call up and I'd say, I'm, I make up a name, you know. I'm revealing intrepid, all this stuff now. Intrepid job hunting. And I'd say, I'm, I'm assisting this producer, a real producer. And they'd say, oh, say hi to him. I said, okay, I will. <laughs> I didn't know the guy. But I said, we're, you know, we're looking for editors for this picture. And uh, there's a real movie that's in the trades. And they said, so I need phone numbers and addresses for these guys, you know. And they gave them to me. So then I'd write letters to these people, mm -hmm. and I'd say, you know, I'm wanting to do anything, sweep up, whatever. And I wrote to about 10 people, and uh, it was amazing. About eight of them got back to me, either phoned or wrote a note. Six or so of them took me to lunch, ended up working for four of them over the years, two of whom were Oscar-winning editors, you know. Richard Halsey, who won an Oscar for Rocky, was a big influence on me. I worked for him for four years. Uh, Bill Reynolds, who won four or five Oscars for Sound of Music and a bunch of films, uh, was another one, you know. These are guys who had done it all, you know. How long did it take to get to where you wanted to be, which was actually editing? About five years, yeah. First movie I edited by myself was Girls Just Want to Have Fun with Helen Hunt and Sarah Jessica Parker. And it was a, and, uh, and then I made, a, I cut about 10 or 12 movies after that. Uh, and then I got on a TV series at Warner Brothers called Life Goes On, which was a show with Patti LuPone. That, well, that must have been really long hours. When you, were you doing a weekly show? Y yeah, it was, uh, it was a network series on ABC. It was on film, it was shot for eight days. And, you know, it was uh, a drama, family drama. Uh, it was about a family with a young Down syndrome child. It was kind of a cutting edge breakthrough series in a lot of ways. I think you've compared film editing to writing. Sure, I learned that later, you know, that uh, the final draft of a script, in the case of film, is in the editing room, you know, uh, where the script is now thrown away and, and now it's the film that was shot from the script and then it's free you know, open season on how you're going to turn this into a film using all the techniques available, not just editing, but sound and mm -hmm. music and other things. When you were editing uh, full time, did you say, I have found exactly where I want to be and now I have, this is where I'm going to stay, this is, this is me? Yeah, I did have that feeling. I, I think I chose well in terms of my personality, you know. Um, a lot of editors make great directors, you know. David Lean was a, was a film editor, Lawrence of Arabia. Hal Ashby was a, won an Oscar for In the Heat of the Night as an editor, but went on to direct 
Harold and Maude and being there. And did you have that aspiration to be a director? I did, yeah, but I was, you know, daunted by it, you know. Um, editors don't often make good directors because it's an insular kind of personality. Directors tend to be more outgoing and mm -hmm. jo jump right into the fray, you know. Mm -hmm. And editors tend to, not to stereotype, but tend to be wanting a more private, mm -hmm. uh, controlled atmosphere. And this set is not a controlled atmosphere. It's basic chaos, you know. And uh, so it took me a while to embrace the chaos, you know. And what did you direct? Well, I did my own things, and then I did documentaries starting in the 80s. Um, music films, I was sort of a failed musician, you know. So I worked that out by making films about musicians. I did, I've done three of them so far. And, uh, and then I directed on Life Goes On. That's when I got in the Directors Guild and, uh, and worked actually in a studio I situation. I would think egos would come even more into play when you're directing on a set. Well, in that case, it was good because people knew me. The actors all knew me and the crew knew me from being a producer and a supervising film editor. And so it was a friend, you know. I was part of the team already, so that was helpful. Um, but uh, yeah, that was, that was a step, you know, of confidence building. In Los Angeles, Lorenzo Di Stefano worked his way up the ranks as a film editor, later becoming a producer and a director. He would eventually branch out on his own as a documentary filmmaker and writer. During one fateful visit to Hawaii in the late 1980s, Di Stefano learned of a family secret, a relative who had been exiled long ago when leprosy was a much feared and little understood disease. Di Stefano set out to meet his forgotten cousin, Olivia Rabello Bretha. Well, first of all, I should say she's one of the most amazing people I ever got to meet, you know. And the fact that she's family was even more a revelation. What was the connection to her? How, how were you related? My mom and her mom, their mothers were sisters, so they were first cousins, yeah. Portuguese girls from Calaheo. How did you meet her? Finally, my mom told me about this cousin of ours who had leprosy, who was in Kalapapa, and um, uh, she, uh, I went over there to meet her. And uh, I hiked down the trail, and uh, she wasn't home. <laughs> I didn't check first, I just figured she's there. She was in Honolulu, so I missed her the first time. Uh, but then I met her in Christmas of 89, and uh, we spent you know 17 years uh, till she died in 2006. Uh, being very close, you know, especially after my mom died in, in, in 96, the 10 years between then and Olivia's death, uh, Olivia who never had kids, you know, uh, who loved children, and uh, I wasn't a kid anymore, but uh, anyway, we bonded. You know, I like to call her the Rosa Parks of leprosy, you know, she's a simple woman like Rosa Parks was, who, Rosa Parks was a maid, you know, who, who took the bus back and forth to white people's houses to work and who wasn't going to change her seat. Came a day when she says, I'm not doing this, you know. And then we know what happened from there. She, she and others kicked off a whole movement, you know. Um, Olivia said, I'm not my disease, you know, I'm not my condition. Call me by my name, Olivia. And I really respected that. So did you remain on the mainland and go back and forth to see Olivia? Yeah, mm -hmm. I did, and she came there. She went to the UN in 97 with uh, Bernard Punikaya and uh, Catherine Polahali and a lot of other patients that were being acknowledged. It was World Leprosy Day, or month, uh, the, the World Health Organization. And so they got to meet Kofi Annan, the Secretary General of the UN, and get medals, and I still have her medal at my house. And uh, she was in, got to go to New York City, the only time she'd been. And uh, so she traveled, you know, like a lot of patients from, from decades of, of isolation, when they were able to travel, they, they just got out of Dodge and went all over the world, Belgium. And, uh, and uh, so not everybody wrote a book, but she did. And so I think she left behind, she confronted, the, she made the best of the disease, I think. She took the disease and said, you're not gonna beat me down. I'm gonna beat you. And uh, I'm going to become what I'm going to become, despite you, you know. And she did. And, you know, she, she made some enemies along the way because she was not... She was feisty. Yeah, she was not about to be pushed around, you know. 
when she died in 2006, you know, it was in the morning for her, and I didn't come to Hawaii for seven years after that. My mom was gone. My dad, her, there was really kind of no reason. I didn't feel, what's, what am I come here and get a tan? You know, don't, what, what am I coming here for? And I came back in October of 13 to put her gravestone. I had a gravestone made in California uh, with a picture of her and John, her husband, and it says together forever on it. It was a nice little stone with the dates that they were married and when they were born and died. And took that over to Kalapapa in October of 13. And that was the first time I'd been back in seven years. And uh, sort of reminded me of what Hawaii meant to me, you know. Mm -hmm. At what time, at what point during the 17 years you, you really got to know Olivia, did you decide, I want to do a play on this? I didn't. Never. Not, not at all during the 17 years? No, because it was happening, you know. She would say, she says, don't, you, don't ever make a movie about my life. I said, fine. You're not so special, I'd say. <laughs> she said, wait a second, what are you talking about? Lorenzo Di Stefano says that his cousin, Olivia Rabello Bretha, taught him the value of fighting oppression and to never lose sight of your quest for dignity. Di Stefano decided to tell the early part of Olivia's life story and her encounters with the stigma of leprosy through a one-act play he wrote and directed called Shipment Day, which was staged at Manoa Valley Theater in Honolulu in late 2018. She, she described to you what her life was like before she contracted the disease. And um, he, he, your play shows that, what it was like. She was, mm -hmm. she was an 18-year-old uh, expecting to be married soon and still living with her parents yeah, and yeah. very Portuguese household. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that's in her book as well as stories that she told me and stuff. But it's very much in her book in the early chapters. What was the hardest thing about writing uh, your Olivia play? It really wasn't difficult, you know? It wrote... It wrote itself? Well, I don't say it wrote itself. I mean, it was a one-act play, 20 minutes, when we did it at Play Builders of Hawaii, which is a local play development program run by Terry Madden. Uh, it's a terrific program that they, uh, they have here. And we won Best Play, and Kuule Shafi won Best Actress, and William Ha'o won Best Actor for this little 20-minute thing we did. And that's what got Manoa Valley Theater interested in a full version. And so I, they asked me to write a full version. It was in that moment that I became a stranger, leaving a home and people that I loved. Inclusion is important, um, and yet uh, people's fears, I don't know, you have to deal with them in a creative way. And that's what's great about cinema and theater, you know, is that you get people in the dark and you kind of own them for a little while. It's a privilege, you know, to have people, especially when they bought a ticket, you know. And you need to honor that the fact that they did choose to leave the house when they really don't need to leave the house anymore. They can switch on anything they want. Um, so to take that uh, uh, privilege of having them show up and try to maybe transform them a little bit, or I don't use the word educate so much because that implies they're not educated, but to show them, expose them to something that they maybe weren't expecting, you know, so that a controversial character even someone who's completely divergent from their belief system. You know, if you're a Democrat and you, you take a Republican type character and make them human, that's good. Is there one paramount lesson or piece of wisdom you take away after having known Olivia for so long? Yeah, basically it's like don't give up to your, uh, to, to the tormentors, you know, in your life, the people who you know, not everybody's in an extreme situation like that, you know, where you're really incarcerated. Um, Self-belief, you know, pride of, not, not that kind of pride that's uh, boastful pride or anything like that, but the inner strength, you know. Um, yeah, she was strong, super strong person. Yeah, that I guess I take away, you know. I guess I was drawn into those worlds, hidden worlds, 
which if you're looking back, if I don't look back a lot, I try to look forward, but looking back, I guess there's a kind of continuity there, you know, to discovery, finding out what's, what's unseen or what's overlooked, you know. And I think there's a commonality there throughout everything I've done, which basically comes down to being a curious person, you know. Lorenzo Di Stefano is having his play Shipment Day translated into both Spanish and Portuguese with the hope of sharing Olivia's story with foreign audiences. And as curious as ever, he continues to discover hidden stories to bring to both the big screen and the stage. Mahalo to Lorenzo Di Stefano, former Islander who makes his home in Ventura, California. And thank you for joining us for this edition of Long Story Short on PBS Hawaii. I'm Leslie Wilcox. Aloha Nui. For audio and written transcripts of all episodes of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, visit pbshawaii.org. To download free podcasts of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, go to the Apple iTunes Store or visit pbshawaii.org. And everybody loves stories. I mean, a, we've got to find some commonality here, you know, as people get torn apart by political differences and ideological differences, those maybe never can be healed, you know, maybe we're in a place where it's getting wider and wider, but people not being able to really find any place to relate. And I do firmly believe, and I'm certainly not alone in this, that the arts is one place if you can get people in.